Welcome everyone to today's webinar, Tough Cases Achieving All Targets. This session is brought to you by No Diabetes by Heart, a joint venture by the American Heart Association and the American Diabetes Association. My name is Robert of Bob Eckel. I'm a professor of medicine emeritus at the University of Colorado Anschutz Medical Campus in Aurora, Colorado. And I'm also privileged to be past president of both the American Diabetes Association and the American Heart Association. Today, we're joined by two experts who will discuss how to help patients with type 2 diabetes achieve their blood glucose, blood pressure, and lipid targets through a coordinated, co coordinated team approach that really means gives a means to the end so it's much more effective in today's medicine. Before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge the sponsorship of the main sponsor of this meeting, and that's Novo Nordisk, along with the national sponsor, Bayer. I want to thank you for your support. Now I'd like to introduce the speakers for today's program. Dr. Am Gonda is a senior physician and a clinical research scientist at Johnson Center and an associate professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School. Dr. Sadia Khan is a cardiologist at Northwestern Medicine and an assistant professor in the Department of Medicine at Northwestern University Feinberg School of Medicine. Am, um, let's get the program started, please. First of all, I'd like to thank um, AHA and ADA and the, and the organizing team to invite me uh, to participate in this uh, webinar. Uh, let me just uh, go to my disclosures. And I'd like to begin with uh, by simply pointing out, so here are the statistics uh, of the pandemic of diabetes that we're all facing worldwide. And in 2019, according to the IDF uh, last atlas, there were 463 million people living with diabetes in the world. And now that number in 2021 has gone up already to 537 million. And this number is projected to go to 643 million. So there is no respite in the uh, epidemiology and uh, rising number of cases of diabetes. 80% of the people with diabetes in the world live in low and middle income countries. Diabetes is responsible for a lot of deaths, 6.7 million uh, as of last year. Uh, and diabetes is very expensive disease. And in, in addition to diabetes, there are 541 million people who have impaired glucose tolerance, uh, which is a form of uh, prediabetes. So looking at the United States data in the next slide, you can see that in the US, as of 2019, there were 37 million people with diabetes, 11% of the US population, of which uh, uh, about uh, two thirds uh, are diagnosed. Uh, about 23% of adults are still undiagnosed, call it one out of four. In addition to these 37 million people with diabetes, there are 96 million people uh, in the adult age group that have prediabetes, that's almost 40% of the adult US population. And if you look at the older population, 65 and older, almost one in two have prediabetes, which includes impaired fasting glucose and impaired glucose tolerance. So we have a huge pandemic that has been going on for a while. Now we're going to focus in this particular study on cardiovascular disease outcomes in diabetes. And I just wanted to uh, uh, highlight this particular review article that appeared a number of years ago now, which looked at 102 prospective studies in almost 700,000 people uh, over many years of follow-up. And it showed, like many other epidemiological studies have shown, that if you have diabetes, your risk of cardiovascular events increases by two to two and a half fold. Even the risk of cardiovascular mortality increases by more than two fold. And even though this data in 2010, the, the statistics remain very similar in many uh, review articles that have been published looking at this kind of statistics. Now, Anne Haynes most recently uh, published this paper in New England Journal last year, where they looked at how well we are doing regarding our glycemic blood pressure and LDL cholesterol goals uh, in the United States. They looked at about 6,600 people and compared the data from 20 years ago to the most recent data in 2020. And you can see 
actually you can't see this in the slide, but you can uh, look at this article. Unfortunately, only about 50 to 55% of the people with diabetes have A1C goal of less than 7%. Only about 50 to 60% of the people have LDL cholesterol goal or non-HDL cholesterol goal that is being met according to current uh, uh, guidelines. And finally, even the blood pressure control is not being achieved in more than 70% or so of people. In addition to that, despite of some uh, novel drugs that are available on top of lifestyle um, uh, uh, measures, uh, in spite of all the new drugs that are more cardiovascular friendly and reduce the risk of cardiovascular outcomes in addition to glycemic control, they are still being used in only about 5% of the total number of patients with diabetes in the United States. Uh, the number is improving gradually, but is far below what it should be, as we'll discuss uh, in, the, in this uh, webinar. Um, so I already mentioned the medication use. I also want to highlight this most recent life check that uh, American Heart Association has, uh, has introduced called the uh, Life's Essential Aid. So it's not just about controlling hyperglycemia. It is about preventing hyperglycemia progression and preventing cardiovascular disease. So this includes uh, nutritional guidelines, uh, exercise, uh, blood sugar monitoring, uh, body weight control, obesity is a rising epidemic, uh, lipid management, blood pressure management, uh, stopping, to, uh, stopping smoking, and most recently, the eighth life's essential element that was added was the quality of the sleep. Each of these plays a role in the cardiovascular complications, whether you have diabetes or prediabetes or no diabetes or prediabetes. Looking at the next slide, um, how well are we doing in achieving these uh, life's essential eight? And this data is very, very sobering. This was looked at very recently. Less than 1% of the population uh, is achieving these kinds of all eight essentials, including children less than 20, 12 years of age. How many are achieving five metrics out of these eight? Among the adolescents, 45%, age 20 to 39, 32%, age 40 to 59, only 11% when the type two diabetes incidence starts to increase and becomes uh, higher and higher progressively. And age above 60, where there's a majority of people with diabetes living right now, that number is only 4%. So these are indeed um, very sobering statistics and they remind us that we all have to participate in educating our patients to meet these uh, essential goals. Now, with that background, I'd like to present to a patient and we'll ask a couple of questions. So this is a 55 year old Hispanic woman who presents in the office with type two diabetes. She was diagnosed about six years ago. Her last eye exam was three years ago, which showed mild non-proliferative diabetic retinopathy, NPDR. She has no cardiovascular disease. She works at a school cafeteria. She has met with the nutritionist and she says she's doing the best she can to follow the nutritional advice that she was given. She walks 20 to 30 minutes twice per week, just twice per week. Her body mass index is 32.5. So you can see that uh, she has crossed that threshold of 30, certainly has been overweight for some time. Uh, she has history of high blood pressure. She has no known kidney disease. Her blood pressure is 132 over 82. Her father had type two diabetes and he had a stroke at age 62. A, a patient scenario quite familiar, familiar to most of you, I'm sure, in your daily practice. Let's go on to the next slide here. Uh, she's on currently uh, on metformin, citagliptin, glargine at bedtime, uh, lacinopril, 10 milligram, and atorvastatin, 20 milligram daily. Looking at her lab results, her A1C is currently 8.2%. Her calculated uh, GFR is 70. Her urine albumin creatinine ratio checked over a few times uh, has been ranging between 50 and 60 microgram per milligram creatinine. Her LDL cholesterol on the statin dose uh, is 80. 
HDL cholesterol is 36, her triglyceride is 220. Uh, her TSH is normal, and she presents some uh, blood glucose monitoring data from home uh, with a meter, and her fasting glucose is between 140 and 170, and postprandial and bedtime sugars range between 180 and 240. Let's go to the next slide. Given the scenario about her history, medications, and lab results, regarding her glycemic control, which of the following will be your next option? A, and please uh, vote, stop glargine, start pre-mixed insulin 70-30 or 75-25 twice a day. Uh, second option, stop DPP-4 inhibitor and start her on GLP-1 uh, receptor agonist. Uh, number three, continue current treatment and add SGLT2 inhibitor. And number four, uh, D, continue current treatment, add pyoglitazone. Please vote. As soon as the voting is completed, I'd like to see the answers to see what people are thinking. Okay, here we go. So a small minority of you uh, chose answer D, adding a pyoglitazone. Excellent. Uh, some of you thought uh, we should stop glargine and should start pre-mixed insulin twice a day. Fairly convenient. Uh, number, uh, the most uh, voted on item was stop DPP-4 inhibitor and start a GLP-1 receptor agonist. And about one out of three of you uh, so chose the option of adding SGLT2 inhibitor. Now, we'll discuss this more in the panel discussion later on. But uh, personally, I would uh, agree with the majority here that we need to start her on a GLP-1 receptor agonist. And when you do that, you don't need to keep her on DPP-4 inhibitor. Answer number C is not a bad option. Actually, many people would choose to do that as you did. And it's also a cardiovascular friendly drug as we'll see later. Uh, but given the overall scenario, uh, I would say that right now, an agent like GLP-1 receptor agonist will not only cause significant weight loss, but also improve her glycemic control and has other anti-atherogenic properties as well. So you did very well with that question. Next slide, please. So what are the major effects of these two novel agents that we use for glycemic control uh, when diet alone or exercise alone or a combination of the two is not enough? Somebody is on already metformin, let's say. So what would you choose next? in somebody who has high risk of cardiovascular disease. So we know from many studies now over the years that GLP-1 receptor agonists and SGLT2 inhibitors are the preferred drugs to add regardless of the A1C and regardless of the um, glycemic control achieved uh, day long uh, in people who have high risk of cardiovascular disease. And she's uh, one of those individuals. Uh, GLP-1 receptor agonists have effects on satiety they cause weight loss, and they have other effects on uh, vasculature called anti-atherosclerotic effects. SGLT2 inhibitors have primarily hemodynamic effects due to a variety of mechanisms not completely understood, but they cause naturesis, and they cause glycosuria, and they improve glycemic control. In addition, they have uh, some uh, unique effects on myocardium and on the kidney, so they have um, major uh, uh, benefactory effects on both uh, cardiovascular system and renal system. So do GLP-1 receptor agonists, but depends upon individual circumstances. And we'll get to that later on. Before we leave this uh, uh, case discussion, I would like to ask you one question about a lipid management. Uh, if I can go back, let me just uh, uh, refresh your memory, but just to remind you, uh, here we go. Her lipid profile currently on atorvastatin 20 milligram is LDL cholesterol 80, HDL cholesterol 36, triglyceride 220, her A1C is 8.2. So let's ask this question, which is uh, sometimes the subject of some debate. Regarding her lipid management, which of the following should be the next step? A, add nicotinic acid. B, add phenofibrate. C, add azetamide and D, reassess lipids after improve, improving glycemic control and lifestyle improvement. Please vote. Okay, wonderful. 
So very few of you thought uh, we should add nicotinic acid. I agree because according to the most recent data, adding niacin in this particular patient will not provide much benefit. They may have some adverse effects, including hyperglycemia. Adding phenofibrate has been a worldwide very popular option over the years, for past many years, with somebody with hypertrichidemia. And it's still being used very widely throughout the world. But uh, this sounds like a very educated group. You know that there has been a lot of controversy, especially most recently with the ACCORD trial, that if you have someone treated well with the statin, such as in the ACCORD lipid study, perhaps the only study so far large enough to show the, um, the combination of uh, statin and phenofibrate versus, uh, versus statin alone, did not show any clear-cut benefits. So this will not be uh, an ideal choice in this particular patient. Adding azetamibe uh, may bring her LDL cholesterol down a little bit, but remember looking at the guidelines, we already know that she is on a moderately intensive statin therapy, atorvastatin 20 milligram. And uh, if you calculate her cardiovascular risk, uh, she probably doesn't need to go on azetamibe to lower the LDL much further. So I agree with you that 61% of you chose this answer that we are not in a big hurry to add another medication. People with diabetes already are on multiple medications and her A1C is above 8% and she is obese and she does not have a good lifestyle program, ideal program, although she tries. So reassessing lipids after improving glycemic control and lifestyle would be the best choice. Okay, now I want to get to uh, the various uh, guidelines that have been published most recently and many of these are updated quite frequently. And I just wanted to give you an overview on where we stand. Uh, as you know, ADA publishes standards of medical care every year, and they update them throughout the year. So it's a living document. The most recent um, um, publication was in January of 2022, which was updated later on. In addition, there are AHA uh, guidelines, most recently in 2022, uh, there's a recent uh, document I would like to refer to all of you if you have not seen it, Comprehensive Management of Cardiovascular Risk Factors for Adults with Type 2 Diabetes. Um, in 2019, European Society of Cardiology published their guidelines on diabetes, pre-diabetes, and cardiovascular disease. And 2020, um, the American College of Cardiology, uh, for the second time, uh, published their expert consensus decision pathway on novel therapies for cardiovascular risk reduction in patients with type 2 diabetes. So in, in essence, all of these guidelines uh, have similar recommendations with uh, minor differences uh, uh, in numbers. Uh, but overall, they are very much uh, in concordance with each other. And we have learned a lot from these guidelines uh, going forward as uh, we have uh, better and better tools to improve glycemic control. So going to the next slide, I just want to show you one other slide from the American Heart Association. Uh, this was published very recently, just about two months ago, which brings to the point, a very important point of health equity across populations, which has been a big stumbling block in achieving our goals, as you know. A uh, number of social determinants of health come into play. So when we talk about cardiovascular risk reduction in adults with type 2 diabetes, we need to first of all think about screening them for cardiovascular disease, which is not always done. Lifestyle management has to be stressed. And among these two, uh, one should then go on to talk about blood pressure management, lipid management, including some of the novel therapies that did not exist until 2015, PCSK9 inhibitors, statins, and most recently, bempedoic acid. And by way of glycemic management, uh, not only need, we need to think about lifestyle management, but when needed and often needed because of somewhat inadequate response as drugs like GLP-1 receptor agonists, SGLT2 inhibitors, and um, some people would require aspirin for prophylaxis as well as the antithrombotic agent. But the social determinants of health uh, play a big role in achieving our goals. This includes education level, uh, neighborhood uh, environment, uh, social and community uh, centers availability, uh, healthcare access 
and, and, and quality of healthcare access. And of course, uh, a very important uh, economic factor about the cost of medications and availability of those medications for everyone who is uh, socially not so privileged. So I wanted to bring up this very important review for your consideration uh, to look at. So what are these uh, latest uh, ADA um, standards of care, um, also co-sponsored by American College of Cardiology very recently? So when it comes to pharmacological treatment of hyperglycemia, first-line therapy depends now on comorbidity, not just that what everybody should start on metformin, which is still a recommendation, but it should be patient-centered treatment factors, including cost and access considerations and management. Of course, many of the cardiovascular trials were carried out in people who already were on metformin in about two thirds of cases. So metformin still remains a very logical first choice by way of cost, as well as efficacy in glycemic control. But when that alone is not enough, or even while that is going on, regardless of baseline A1C, regardless of individualized A1C target or metformin use, if somebody has cardiovascular disease or has uh, signs of high risk of cardiovascular disease or heart failure or chronic kidney disease, one should consider some novel agents that have been available now for some time. And uh, let me just point out um, in the next slide, this is the most recent update again. And you can see that in such people um, with cardiovascular disease or high risk, one should consider either a GLP-1 receptor agonist or a SGLT2 inhibitor for cardiovascular risk reduction. And for those who achieve additional goal, uh, one can consider then later on other options. In one situation where a patient has a history of heart failure, SGLT2 are preferred drug because they have proven benefits in this population. And when it comes to uh, uh, chronic kidney disease, which is seen in 30 to 40% of people with type 2 diabetes, if these people have overt proteinuria, such as more than 200 milligram per milligram of creatinine, preferably these people should be given the advantage of SGLT2 inhibitors first, because the data uh, is very strong with three different uh, various uh, um, trials that have been carried out, which show their cardiovascular protective effects. In patients without proteinuria, but CKD, GFR less than 60, one can use either one of these agents and, uh, and a patient has a high risk of cardiovascular disease. Of course, again, GLP-1 receptor and followed by SGLT2. Uh, if one cannot be used, the other one should be substituted. In some cases, although not proven, one may consider using both. And finally, when somebody has persistent hyperglycemia, then one can think about other choices, including insulin and other agents. In the rest of the people uh, who don't have cardiovascular disease or very high risk of cardiovascular disease in primary prevention to improve hyperglycemia, one should still consider some of these newer agents to minimize the risk of hypoglycemia. So these agents include DPV-4 inhibitors, GLP-1 receptor agonists, SGLT2, even some cases, uh, TZDs, uh, which have been shown to improve glycemic control. And finally, again, uh, if the A1C target is not reached, one should think about other factors. Uh, we also know that GLP-1 receptor agonists and SGLT2 inhibitors are preferred in people who desire more weight loss. And finally, of course, if cost is a main consideration, some of the older drugs are still useful, such as sulfonylureas and TZDs, or even low dose of insulin along with these oral agents. So combination of GLP-1 receptor agonist and basal insulin, for example, is a preferred combination in many people uh, who start off with oral agents, then injectable once a week these days, and then adding basal insulin rather than going to more complicated uh, insulin program, um, such as multiple insulin injections. And this is uh, uh, just to reiterate uh, the emphasis that ADA has provided on the goals of care. The main goal is to prevent complications and to improve the quality of life. One needs to use the SMART goals, specific, measurable, achievable, realistic, and time-limited uh, in case of individual patients. So these are the uh, goals that one needs to think about. Agree on the management plan, 
I won't go into all of this, but the important thing is uh, to avoid the therapeutic inertia and to proceed with achieving not only glycemic goals, but cardiovascular uh, risk factor goals, including lipids and blood pressure. And speaking of that, uh, I must mention before closing that ADA has been very proactive recently on, uh, on, on uh, finding ways to reduce uh, therapeutic inertia. In a recent meeting that was uh, uh, convened by the ADA a couple of years ago, they asked the audience, actually in this word cloud, you can see, they were asked, what are the three factors which you think will improve the therapeutic inertia to proceed and use the right drugs uh, at the right time early enough so that we use them preventing before we have to deal with the complications. And you can see the most common answers were physicians don't have enough time, physicians require more education, uh, patients require more education, reimbursement issues, access to uh, various uh, agents, as I mentioned before, uh, guidelines availability. Uh, some of the guidelines may not still be widely disseminated, motivation on the part of the patients, and so, so on and so forth. So with that, I'd like to, I'd like to uh, show my last slide, which is again in the ADA guidelines, uh, that right now uh, we, ha we have to say glycemic uh, uh, management is only one of the pillars of, uh, of uh, uh, the need to prevent diabetes complications. Much more important for microvascular complications, but also important for cardiovascular complications. In addition for cardiovascular complications uh, and nephropathy, blood pressure management, uh, lipid management, and agents with cardiovascular and kidney benefit, which uh, we alluded to and we'll discuss more later on. So thank you very much for your kind attention. Taking over here for our second case, um, really, really um, excited to compliment the case that you've heard already with a little bit more discussion. I'd like to thank the American Diabetes Association and the American Heart Association for the opportunity to discuss this with you all. So as we heard, um, diabetes is associated with increased risk for cardiovascular disease. And what's particularly concerning is that we've seen an increase in complications. While there was significant improvements between 1990 and 2010 in complications such as acute MI, stroke, lower extremity amputations, since 2010, there's been an overall plateau, but particularly among younger and middle-aged adults, so 18 to 64, there have been increases in the absolute event rates for acute MI, stroke, and lower extremity amputation. While there's a lot of different reasons that may be happening, part of what we want to cover and address in this webinar is what are the comprehensive strategies to address cardiovascular risk factors in people living with diabetes and how can we prioritize younger and middle-aged adults who are experiencing more and more complications. We also know that available therapies for diabetes are growing. Diabetes is a complex condition, and there is an expanding number of therapies. We're up to 12 non-insulin therapies that can be used, and each have unique benefits, particularly for patients that may have specific cardiovascular risk factors. Is a patient more at risk for ASCVD and would benefit from a GLP-1 RA, or are they more at risk for heart failure or have heart failure or CKD and may benefit more from an SGLT2 inhibitor? And as we better understand the profile of these agents and who we may be able to tailor, we may be able to personalize therapy for patients with diabetes. So what do we know about CVD risk factor control from observational data? Of course, improving risk factor control is going to improve outcomes. But one of the questions that this study asked that was published in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2018 was, can we mitigate risk by controlling risk factors? And so they looked at five core risk factors shown here, A1C control, LDL cholesterol, albuminuria, smoking, and blood pressure. And they looked at a group of patients over 200,000 with diabetes and about a million matched controls. And they compared the risk of excess CVD, all-cause mortality, among people that had all of their risk factors controlled as well as how many of those risk factors were controlled. And what they saw were among people who had every single one of these risk factors at optimal target, they had the same rate of MI and stroke. Now the risk for heart failure was still elevated even with optimal control, which suggests there may be alternate mechanisms for ASCVD versus heart failure 
but tells us that we have a lot of opportunity from comprehensive management by controlling not just glycemic management, but other key cardiovascular risk factors in our patients. So I showed this quote because I, I think this is the crux of the no diabetes by heart and really the collaboration between ADA and AHA here. And Dr. Eckel really exemplifies this collaboration, having been a past president of both societies and living at this intersection. Perhaps it is now appropriate to establish a new specialty, diabetic cardiology, or I think others like Dr. Eckel have really proposed a cardiometabolic health subspecialty that incorporates both the aspects of endocrinology and cardiology in a subspecialty for internal medicine trainees whose practitioners will become the frontline troops in this war. And as we think about obesity as the most prevalent chronic disease of our time and diabetes being highly prevalent, this of course is gonna be a really important aspect of the care of our patients. So for my case, we're gonna focus on a 55-year-old African-American woman who's been living with type two diabetes, obesity, hypertension, and hyperlipidemia, who comes into clinic with worsening shortness of breath with exertion. She's had type two diabetes for 15 years and notes increasing stress at work and worse sleep in the last two months. Her history is shown here. In addition to the cardiovascular risk factors, I'll point out her reproductive history with a prior pregnancy complicated by gestational diabetes, as well as premature menopause at age 39 years. And of course, premature menopause has been defined as occurring before the age of 40 years um, as a risk enhancing factor by the American Heart Association. Her social history is shown here, no tobacco, some social alcohol, and works in a sedentary job as an administrative ass assistant. Her medications are shown here, both for diabetes as well as her ACE inhibitor and her statin. Family history includes a mom and sister with diabetes and a father with a heart attack at age 55 or premature heart disease. So we'll start with our first poll question, which will be coming up on your screen. What is the target A1C for this patient? Excellent. So shown here are, is the table from the American Diabetes Association um, standards uh, document and agreeing with the majority of the response here, a, a target of less than 7%, where 76% of you answered um, is the appropriate answer with the contingency that this is based on a patient-centered framework with shared decision-making about risks. So the, the target of less than 7% is appropriate in non-pregnant adults without significant hypoglycemia. And of course, that can be altered or tailored based on patient preference, clinician judgment, particularly related to the harms. Specifically, if there's concern of excessive hypoglycemia, then altering that, as well as a patient's life expectancy. We also know with growing use of continuous glucose monitoring, a time and range could be another appropriate way to measure and assess target for um, glycemic control. So, our second question is really related to her. Um, diabetes therapy. So if the A1C is at target, should other adjunctive antihyperglycemic therapies have um, be utilized and may they have benefit, particularly in patients with diabetes and CVD? And as this is coming up, Dr. Ganda mentioned this, um, really showing that nice flow diagram of what other therapies could be considered, even if the A1C is at target. Excellent. We've got most people here weighing in for B and C. So adding on an SGLT2 inhibitor as well as a GLP-1 agonist. And most of this um, information we talked about in the last case as well, just to reiterate and highlight, I think when their A1C is not at target, we, are, we have a reason that we're adding on therapy. We know we want to get to our target for A1C. But I wanted to highlight that the flow diagram is really important for our patients that have ASCVD are high risk of ASCVD, have heart failure, or have CKD, because we know there are benefits to these therapies above and beyond the, the benefit of lowering A1C. One of the things that the ADA standards does a really nice job of is, um, uh, is highlighting the importance of tailoring therapy to the social context. And this is something that we all struggle with for our patients. We know what the best treatments are, but can we always get them to the patients who need them? And the really, I think, striking thing in this table, if we look at the column for the median annual wholesale price, the AWP here for a month supply, you see a range from about 40 to 100, 
to as high as over a thousand for GLP-1 receptor agonists. And so at that cost, it's really not affordable for the majority of people who need these therapies. And so as in another aspect of how do we really optimize not just glycemic control, but the optimal combination of therapies for our patients who are at high risk for CVD or are living with CVD. And I think this is an ongoing discussion that requires policy changes at a more structural level. In addition to managing diabetes, the ADA put together a laboratory evaluation guideline that really highlights the temporal nature and continuity of care. So we've got our initial visit when we first meet someone, what should we be doing on a quarterly level, like following up A1C, and, and then an annual visit? And how do we incorporate um, overall um, assessment of our patients with diabetes, including all of the other um, risk factors that they may have, both for ASCVD, like calculating a 10-year risk for those who are aged 40 to 79, so we can optimize risk factor control. Staging of chronic kidney disease is another common complication. And then thinking about two other organ systems where there's less attention paid, but high risk of morbidity uh, is screening for non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, as well as monitoring for cognitive impairment and dementia. And as we think about this overall comprehensive assessment, we think about the way that we want to approach our whole patient and see how we can identify and optimize both quality of life as well as longevity of life. And this really brings up that overall goal is risk factor-based care in diabetes. So we know that in addition to optimal non-insulin antihyperglycemic therapies, what are key guideline-based medical therapies to consider? And I like to think about the various comorbidities that we often encounter in our patients with diabetes and think about them one by one. Have we optimized therapy for obesity, particularly with GLP-1 RAs? Have we optimized therapy for hypertension? And is that a goal? Hyperlipidemia. And we'll talk a little bit more about what targets for these should be. For coronary heart disease and stroke, heart failure, and chronic kidney disease. And as we think about the whole patient, can we optimize team-based multidisciplinary care? And perhaps there are cardiometabolic health specialists that are coming, but today, how can we do this in an environment where we are collaborating among primary care, family medicine, cardiology, and endocrinology? So one of the key points that that last slide makes is that oftentimes obesity is viewed as a risk factor, but I think shifting that as well to a chronic disease that the same way we treat hypertension and treat diabetes, can we really optimize the treatment of obesity? And I think we have a lot of hope and optimism that GLP-1 RAs, both semaglutide as well as now terzip terzipeptide, which I can't ever pronounce right, um, is going to give us new hope and options for our patients um, if they can be affordable. So our next question is, um, what lipid therapy can we use? So in a patient with diabetes and a high 10-year risk of ASCVD, where the predicted risk based on pooled cohort equations is over 20%, what is an appropriate lipid-lowering therapeutic regimen? So we got our options here and we'll weigh in. This may not have one perfect answer. So I, I think there's room for debate here on exactly what we should be doing. Excellent. So we've got um, a wide range of answers here, both no statin, moderate intensity, high intensity, high intensity, but plus azetamibe. So I'll actually point us to the primary prevention um, section of the ADA document and look at the level of evidence across these. So I, I think that's where there is definitely room for interpretation of how best to manage lipid lowering therapy in our patients with diabetes. I think the best level of evidence for, for our therapies comes for patients who have, uh, who are 40 to 75, who have diabetes, but don't yet have atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, moderate intensity statin therapy. So that's kind of the bare minimum. Um, and then we want to think about are in those who are at higher risk, should we intensify to high intensity statin therapy or consider adding azetamibe as well? Um, and I think both of those are reasonable options. And particularly what I didn't tell you is what is the LDL cholesterol? Did we maximize to reduce by 50% or greater? And is that still above 70? And so those are things that I think as you're caring for people, trying to minimize the number of therapies that someone's on, but also maximizing um, their LDL cholesterol is important. Secondary prevention, I think, is very different. And for that, we really do know that high-intensity statin therapy in people who have ASCVD and diabetes 
or even adding on non-statin therapies like azetamibe or PCSK9 inhibitors can really provide benefit for an LDL cholesterol that's over 70, um, greater than or equal to 70 on ma maximally tolerated statin dose. We know that there's a lot of concerns in terms of what the maximally tolerated statin dose may be. And especially in those who don't tolerate statins, PCSK9 inhibitors are emerging as a really unique opportunity to be able to lower LDL cholesterol. So for our next question in a patient with diabetes without ASCVD, what is the target blood pressure goal? And I think again here, there's um, different answers based on AHA and ADA. So we'll talk a little bit about the nuance for that and let um, folks weigh in for their target choice. Excellent. So we've got a little bit of a mix and as expected, less than 130 over 80 and less than 140 over 90 being our two major answers. And that's actually what the two targets are between the ADA and, and ACC AHA. The ADA recommendations are focused on a, a target of less than 140 over 90 for patients with diabetes at lower risk for CVD and less than 130 over 80 for patients who are at higher risk of ASCVD. And that's judged by a pooled cohort equation, 10-year risk greater than or equal to 15% or existing ASCVD, where a blood pressure of less than 130 over 80 may be appropriate if safely attained. In the ACCAHA recommendations, this is focused, um, recommends a target of less than 130 over 80 in all adults with diabetes and hypertension. And considering adults with diabetes and hypertension, that all first-line classes of antihypertensives are useful and effective. And some of this controversy comes from the studies that are shown here that just to briefly mention, of course, we know that in the ACCORD blood pressure study, intensive risk factor modification in a trial of patients with diabetes did not have a benefit in cardiovascular events. In contrast, the SPRINT study, which is the primary study that the ACC AHA guidelines recommend intensive blood pressure lowering from did have a benefit, but was not just enrolling patients with diabetes. And so there isn't clear evidence based on RCTs in the subset of the population with diabetes to say that a goal of less than 130 over 80 would definitely be beneficial. And there are harms associated with intensive risk factor lowering. So I think this is more, this is one more case where a really patient-centered discussion and shared decision making about what the potential harms are, but also the optimal benefits. In terms of aspirin, this is another common one that comes up in patients with diabetes without ASCVD. Is there a benefit from aspirin for risk reduction? So we have a mix of answers here. And you know, part of the question, of course, is there a benefit? But is that net benefit outweigh the risks is really the question we wanna be asking. And so in the most recent USPSTF guidelines that were just recently published a few months ago, they evaluated the evidence in terms of potential risks, which of course concerning our GI, ble GI bleeding and intracranial bleeding, as well as the potential benefits for reduction of non-fatal MI, non-fatal stroke, um, and GI malignancy, which isn't shown here. But really the critical question comes up is, is the benefit of aspirin outweigh the risks in people with diabetes? And that was really answered by the ASCEND trial recently where over 15,000 people were enrolled and followed for about seven years. And what that trial showed was that the absolute event rates were relatively low. And even though there was a slight reduction in events, on those in aspirin, there was an increase in bleeding. So the overall net benefit was null. And I think this is where, again, nuanced discussion with a patient, if you have a patient who has um, high risk for ASCVD and low risk for bleeding, aspirin may be of benefit in those 50 and older. Under 50, even with high risk factors, we wouldn't recommend the use of aspirin routinely. I know Dr. Ganda mentioned this, but I do think at the central core of management for patients with diabetes, we really want to make sure we're optimizing cardiovascular health and lifestyle measures. And that also in the most recent Life's Essential 8, which we saw the overall circle for, incorporates sleep. And in our case scenario, we were talking about poor sleep quality and really incorporating physical activity, diet, and sleep as key behaviors that we can address and support change for. Our last question is focused around the reproductive history that we provided. And in our female patient, what are unique risk enhancing factors for CVD that should be identified in a comprehensive medical evaluation so that we're ensuring that these questions are asked and monitored when evaluating our patients? 
Excellent. So the majority of us chose gestational diabetes and premature menopause as reproductive risk factors. We know that individuals who experience gestational diabetes during one or more of their pregnancies are at much higher risk, up to tenfold higher risk of developing diabetes. So among those who have who are developing diabetes, we know that there's a huge enrichment among women for gestational diabetes. Unfortunately, in the past several decades, we've seen a remarkable increase in the cases of gestational diabetes that have doubled and are now as high as 12% of pregnant individuals in populations that are enriched for diabetes like South Asians. We also know there are significant disparities, and these can be really red flags to help intensify prevention if we identify this earlier in the life course. In addition, the reference provided here looked at premature menopause, both natural and surgical, and demonstrated that this was significantly associated with increased risk of cardiovascular disease. The study wasn't focused on people living with diabetes, but highlighted the importance of a full reproductive history, including age at menarche, age at menopause, and complications of pregnancy that are important risk-enhancing factors for cardiovascular disease. And the review article here from the um, ACC CVD Committee in Women really highlights the opportunities for primary prevention and sex-specific risk factors um, for cardiovascular disease prevention in women. So I'm going to conclude there and uh, thank you again for your time and looking forward to the discussion. So as posted to you in the chat box earlier today, you have an opportunity now to ask questions. So at this point in time, I'd like to begin a discussion about ultimately uh, some of the questions that are coming in. And the first question I have is uh, for diabetes patients with chronic kidney disease and a GFR less than 20 mils per minute, is there anything we can do to help slow down the CDK the CKD progression? And ultimately, I think the issue of medications come up here. Yeah, so uh, great question. I would say none of the clinical trials that have been carried out so far with SGLT2 inhibitors uh, in CKD patients have included people under the GFR of about 25. One such study is currently in progress, actually looking at GFR as low as 20. Uh, but uh, when it comes to a patient like the one you just proposed, uh, just uh, summarized, I would say the most important thing would be blood pressure control that can still help uh, these people and you know nutritional uh, uh, composition should be reassessed uh, although it's pretty flexible uh, but given their high phosphorus high hyperkalemia some of the blood pressure medication may have to be revised uh, or substituted so glycemic control may not have much of an impact at this stage although still it's reasonable to keep the hemoglobin a1c closer to eight percent in my opinion and again, there is no fixed uh, data on this based on clinical trials, but I would still say blood pressure control becomes the most important and, and, and looking at the parameters that make us think about uh, changing the blood pressure medication in hyperkalemia patients. One thing that neither one of you talked about is the importance of glycemic control in modifying cardiovascular disease risk. So, Sidi, I'm going to start with you and then end up with Am and also make a comment as to perhaps something to draw the uh, webinar attendees to, to attention. So Am, um, Sidi, go ahead. Oh, awesome. Thank you. And I think that's a really, really important point and was highlighted in the Swedish study in the New England Journal of Medicine, where with successively improved glycemic control, there was lower risk for CBD events and particularly for heart failure, where control of all the risk factors still left excess risk for heart failure, but optimizing glycemic control really minimized the risk for CVD overall. So I think absolutely agree with you, a really important point. Um, your thoughts on that? Yeah, uh, I just great. want to add to that, uh, that I think the only excellent data that we have on the importance of glycemic control on preventing cardiovascular complication is our old DCCT study carried out in people with type 1 diabetes many years ago. Yeah. These people were very young when the study began with the mean age of 22 or 23. And by the time the study ended, they were like six years later, 29 year old. So there were not enough cardiovascular events. But after following these people during the extended observation period in the EDIC study that I've been part of, uh, and we now find that those who achieved intensive 
uh, glycemic control with hemoglobin A1C closer to 7% during the DCCT are now benefiting from reduction in the cardiovascular outcomes. And these outcomes are primarily determined by the glycemic control and hemoglobin A1C. The only limitation is that we avoided including people with, with definite hyperlipidemia and hypertension at the start of the study. And again, these are type one patients. But right. even for type two patients in the UK PDS trial, we have at least 10 year follow-up data after the UK PDS study was completed in 1998. And they also showed that there is a, there is a persistence of the benefit in cardiovascular outcomes and even mortality after 10 years. So we cannot dismiss glycemic control uh, as an important uh, risk factor as well. Although it appears in patients with type two diabetes with given their hypertension and hyperlipidemia, other risk factors, in addition to hyperglycemia, we've got to emphasize uh, much better lipid control and, and blood pressure control. Well, to address this issue in a little bit more detail, Vanita Arruda and myself just published a paper in Diabetes, Obesity, and Metabolism on the importance of glycemia as continued, and monitored, and treated risk factor for cardiovascular disease. Yeah. So I'll just turn to, uh, everyone to that if they're interested in. Yeah, I'm so, glad you mentioned that. I know that you have had a long time interest in this question. Yeah. All right, so we have another question, kind of a long question, so let me read it quickly if I can. Once chronic kidney disease is diagnosed, the latest ADA recommendations address management of the disease through targeted reductions in urinary albumin, optimization of glucose control, optimization of blood pressure and variability, and use of medications to slow CKD progression and avoid cardiovascular events. Can you both comment on these guidelines as it relates to urinary albumin creatinine ratios and those used as targets in medication management? Sadia, you want to go first? Oh, I'll let you go for it. <laughs> okay. Well, I, I would just mention, yes, I think this is an important question. In the past, not much attention has been paid to the albumin-creatinine ratio, and people have been looking at just creatinine and the GFR. But I think we now have evidence from clinical trials, such as the ones with uh, SGLT2 inhibitors, starting with Credence trial, and then with DAPA-CKD, the MPA-CKD results are still pending. But all of these trials that have looked at it, even the cardiovascular trials with SGLT2 inhibitors, they've all shown that SGLT2 inhibitors actually do help improve proteinuria as well. And if you look at the epidemiological data from long time ago, it is both GFR and albuminuria that predict cardiovascular outcomes, individually and together. So if they're both present, then the risk is even higher. We see a number of people who have uh, declining GFR but have no proteinuria. So that's in a way somewhat of a good news because they have somewhat of a lesser risk of advancing kidney disease, but still they should not be ignored. They also have very high risk of cardiovascular outcomes. And we know that once somebody has progressive CKD in the stage 3B or stage 4, meaning GFR less than 30, the risk of cardiovascular outcome is magnified by multifolds. And I think one other thing that I'll add to that is sometimes the reverse is there where we see UACR is elevated in observational studies, but GFR yeah. has not yet declined. And that's a really important association with cardiovascular disease as well, where elevated UACR is associated with cardiovascular remodeling, so subclinical disease, as well as ASCVD and heart failure. Well, in fact, the patient you presented on the urinary albumin creatinine ratio was elevated. So yes. that would be a potential indication for an SGLT2. Yes. What's the role of GLP-1 receptor agonists in type 1 diabetes? And Omni referred to the DCCT edict evaluation. But, you know, type 1, people have questioned whether the development of atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease and heart failure is the same as it is in type 2. So let's quickly address that. We only have a few seconds left. So I would say very quickly that uh, that uh, uh, in these patients, uh, uh, you know, first of all, they're not approved for use in type one diabetes, neither GLP-1 receptor agonist nor SGLT2 inhibitor. But you know, for years we've been using, people have been using me and my colleagues, metformin, for example, and TZDs in people who have severe insulin resistance and obesity. So I think uh, off label, these drugs have been used. I would particularly mention very quickly the SGLT2 inhibitors because these uh, agents by definition work by increasing the levels of ketone bodies at low level, beta-hydroxybutyrate, which may be cardioprotective. Uh, 
But at the same time, in patients with type 1 diabetes, it may induce ketoacidosis if people are not careful. In fact, we tell uh, our patients uh, and physicians, if a patient has a scheduled admission in the hospital, they should stop these agents about a week before the surgery or the procedure because the effects can last for several days after you stop it. So I'm sorry, but our time is up. We're going to have to close now. It's important to invite you also to visit the No Diabetes by Heart website, nodiabetesbyheart.org, for downloadable patient materials that will support you in your practice, guideline information, case studies, and a library of previous webinars and pod podcasts. Please stay tuned as we continue to roll out more webinars and podcasts for healthcare professionals. In closing now, let me encourage all of you to address the follow-up survey link in the chat box or by an email you should have just received. So I'm gonna thank you all for participating in this program and for being part of this as we consider the important relationship between diabetes and cardiovascular disease. And I wanna thank our participants, both Sidiya Khan and Amganda for their excellent contributions. Thank you very much. <laughs>